world, you have to be prepared to try everything a place has to offer. I'm going to take you on a culinary tour of a region famous for its warriors and its long, long winters. With the climate so extreme, it's developed a totally unique cuisine. I'm in Scandinavia! <laughs> the North European peninsula of Scandinavia is made up of Sweden, Denmark, Norway, Finland and Iceland. These countries have had cultural ties since the Vikings and I'll be visiting Sweden and Denmark to learn how the region's cuisine has developed over the centuries. I start my journey in southern Sweden where I'll be dining with the Viking king. Later I'll be sampling reindeer tongue in the north and putting my senses to the test on the Baltic coast. Across the border in Denmark I'll be satisfying my sweet tooth with a pastry or two and discovering the beauty of open sandwiches. My introduction to Scandinavian cuisine is very much linked to the distant past. In fact, 1,000 years ago with those great seafaring warriors, the Vikings. I've come here to take this market and I need pretty women. Historically, the Vikings were known as barbarians, famous for raids and pillage. Now, I've joined 700 Viking enthusiasts at an annual festival, and I'll tell you something, these guys seem to be enjoying living onto their reputation. One reason why the Vikings became looters was the scarcity of food at home. Freezing Scandinavian winters meant that growing vegetables Fishing and trading were out of the question. So during the summer, anything that could be was either salted, smoked or dried. Preserved rations were also ideal for the Vikings' long sea journeys. But on the occasions when fresh produce was available, it was time to eat, drink and be merry. This is empanadas, vegetarian empanadas. Empanadas, that doesn't yes. sound very Viking. Is that Viking? Well, of course it's Viking. Mmm, that's so warm. Yes, I just made them. That's really delicious. I can definitely taste some mushrooms and some spices in there. I'm not quite sure what they are. Incredibly healthy. It's fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, sweet lady. That's most kind of you. The Vikings were very much reliant on the sea for their diet, but they also hunted game and farmed their own livestock. Pork was a particular favourite. Now, I've heard that it's going to be a massive Viking feast tonight, and I've come to find Ava Scorner, who apparently is an expert in Viking cuisine. This is her kitchen, I think. Ava, nice to meet you. I hear you uh, um, know everything there is to know about Viking food. Yeah, uh, some of it. And there's salted pork here. Yeah. In the winter time, it was rather cold, but you couldn't store it for more than one, two weeks. So they salted it, then they could store it for months. So this is good. what's inside the pot here? It's just water, plain water. So what are you putting in there now? The smoked ox meat and also the chopped ox meat. And that's not salted. And then I put some parsley in it. Then I just cook it up. The Vikings had dedicated cookhouses, and first on the fire today is the ox stew, followed by the salted pork, which will be cooked with celeriac, onions, carrots, parsnips, and herbs. It's very simple, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> I think this is a race and they have to face the first person around the boat and back. How's our naked man doing? And he says streaking ahead. <laughs> So the winner gets a massive horn. He must be very happy with that. They get to fill the horn with any kind of drink they want, alcoholic or non-alcoholic. And that's the prize. 
Having built up an appetite, those Vikings are ready for their feast. And when food was available, they certainly put on a spread. Oh, look at that. The stew. Yeah. <gasps> and then this I'm is... Gonna, so I've set one of your... I think use my fingers? Yeah, yeah, that's with the barley. Then, of course, the salted, salted pork, pork, which now looks absolutely fantastic. I'll just take a small piece, yeah? Yes. <gasps> and now you're going to have a cup of meat. Oh, great. Fantastic. As well as eating, drinking was important too. Mead or honey wine washed it all down nicely, and it was also considered an aphrodisiac. It was the Viking Viagra. Sweden has the longest coastline in Europe, and to find out about the country's most traditional fish, herring, I'm travelling to the village of Bernan, on the Baltic coast, which is famous for its smokeries. And it was in the 19th century that 30 families settled here, looking for better fishing waters. Only three of these families are still smoking herring today, and fisherman Lars Barrylund is a direct descendant from the original settlers. Today, people come from far and wide to buy burn and smoked fish, and it's not difficult to find the place. You just follow the smoke and the incredible smell. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Hello. <laughs> Lars, nice to meet you. It's very smoky nice in here, isn't too. it? Are these your wonderful herrings? Yes. God, they're beautiful things, aren't they? These are all from the sea out here, locally caught by yourself? Yes, caught by myself. Fantastic. We're fishing in the nights and the smoking in the days. Look at this! That's incredible! Oh, how, you must be boiling down here. <gasps> that is Almost amazing. Tired. How long have they been in there? Five hours. Five hours? What's this you're actually burning? I call it spruce, but you say it's Christmas. Now, um, I heard a rumour about something called, um, is it the sour or rotten herring? So, Helen. He says he's it's, smiling. It's a shame. Because it really is rotten. <laughs> How long has this been fermenting for? Six weeks. <coughs> oh! And you haven't even moved. Where are the herrings there? Are they floating around in that? They're floating around here. This dubious delicacy dates back to the 16th century, when salt was expensive. Smaller amounts were used for preservation, which resulted in the fish fermenting. Apparently, Lars's recipe is fairly mild, compared to the tin version, which he saved for the sampling. But we're going outside. Why? The taste and the smell. It's too <laughs> the strong smell. to open inside. OK. <laughs> Flies, all the flies are coming. Hmm? They can smell it. <laughs> Cut me off a bit. No, not too much. Oh my God, there's flies everywhere. <laughs> flies are literally going bonkers. You're not going to give me all that. <laughs> Spat it out onto my shoe. Oh my! Can I just say that it's the most. I ate in Thailand once. I ate rotten egg. <laughs> that was far worse. <laughs> I'm leaving the rotten herring behind with Lars but his smoked herring has definitely given me a taste for the fish and to find out more about this national favourite I am jumping across the country to the west coast and the island surrounding Sweden's second city.
One of the biggest events in the Swedish calendar is the Midsummer Festival and I've come to Gothenburg's archipelago to join in the festivities and one of the coolest things about it is getting there. Hit it, Gustav! All right, hold on. I'm heading for Störse, the main island, which is just a short boat ride from the city. Historically, after the long winter, when only preserved food was available, the arrival of summer was time to celebrate fresh produce. Now, I'm here to meet Don Alexa, who is a really well-known chef in these parts, and apparently he knows a thing or two about herrings. And I'm guessing that the smiling guy at the end of the pier, is that you, Don? Merrilies, nice to meet you. Hello. Are you Don? Yes, I am. <laughs> how are you? <laughs> I'm fine. Oh, you got the me? flyer. Huh? Oh, how lovely. You're going to need them later. Why am I going to need them later? We're going to have a good dance. Okay, but we're going to cook first because yes. I believe you're a herring man. Yes, I make good recipes of herring. Oh, fantastic, let's go. <laughs> the island is a car free paradise with a serene environment which makes it a popular residential area for those who can afford to commute to the city. Just tell us what you're making. It's, it's like pickled herring with what's the sauce? It's a mustard sauce with dill. Delicious. Sweet, sour. And is this salted fellow? Yes. <laughs> that, that, it's a salted one. <laughs> so what do we do first? We take some salt. I can see that's lovely sea salt. Yep. And then we take sugar. And then we take the... Dill. Dill. Uh, we love the dill. Look okay, here. We mix it. And then we start to mix. This was great summary. Yeah. <laughs> and then you take the mustard, Swedish mustard. What's different about Swedish mustard? It's even that is sweet. Vinegar. Hey, I'll, I'll stir. Uh, da, da, da. Then the, the, the sugar start to melt. And it's then beautiful you, and glossy, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. And then you take the oil. And what kind of oil is this? Very, very plain, plain uh, oil. Now you start to oh, be very look at glossy. That. It's so glossy. Because you've got, it really is sweet and sour, isn't it? Yeah. You've got the vinegar, you've got the sugar. And I love and, white pepper and, as well. Yeah. The Swedish dishes is very sweet, very sour and salted. And that's because in historically, yeah. when the winters were cold, you'd have had to preserve yeah. everything, wouldn't you? Yeah. And we was a very hard working people before. So Strong. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> Vikings. <laughs> yeah, and then this piglet herring. Then you so make nice little chunks. Yes. Can I try a little bit without yes. the then? Even that one is sour, mm. sweet and like candy. It candy. is like candy. Candy, candy fish. Candy fish. <laughs> candy fish. <laughs> nice. See? Oh, and so then add it to the sauce. Lovely. Oh, I'll stir that, will I? Yep. Like that. That is very easy. If you have a lot of this, then you can make a lot of sauces. And then you put on a different you have herring bowl. feast. Yeah. I'm just going to take a little bit, sneaky preview. Yeah. So I'll we'll both have a try. Cocktail party. So local court herrings, local court sauce. <laughs> mm. It's good, huh? Never mm. had candied fish before. Mm. John, thank you. Mm. You're welcome. It's delicious. Thank you so much. Welcome. I think you've been eating too much herring. What's that now? So why do you do this? Well, traditionally, it's uh, to learn. The kids have to learn about different uh, different animals that walks outside. <laughs> So we are teaching them. And the flowers, is that because it's your celebration, the it's fact that it's summer? It's a celebration of summer, yes. This is the first week uh, when you don't have school anymore. So it's a celebration for summertime. It's really beautiful. And what about like what about food and eating? What's, how, I mean, how do you celebrate? We have a Swedish smorgasbord. Smorgasbord? Yes. All different dishes, lots of herring, lots of strawberries. Herring, Typical never. Summer. <laughs> Typical summer in Sweden. You have to come, join us. Jeanette Adler and her family have lived on the island for 14 years. They've all gathered for their midsummer feast, and I've offered to help prepare another Swedish folk dish. Yummy, it's looking good. Yes, I hope so. Oh, and they say, oh, this is, must be, is this your meatball mixture? Yes. Tell you what, I'll, so, I'll, I'll go in, I'll get my hands dirty. Good for me. So what have we got in here? Minced beef and pork, half-half. 
pepper, salt, whipped cream, breadcrumb, mustard, Is it onion? yes, onion. Chunk it all together. <laughs> oh, good work, good work. I'll put some more strawberries on. This pan over here? It's already hot. Okay. We just love when we can pick the first strawberries, which is around midsummer time. Oh, they're cooking very nicely. So what else have we got here? Obviously some salmon. And this bread, did you make that yourself? Mm -hmm. It's fantastic. Thank and is that, is that shape, is that kind of anything symbolic for summer or? It's that you break the bread from the same bread. It's just like brothers and sisters share bread. Oh, that's lovely. The word smorgasbord loosely translates as open sandwich, although it is in fact a buffet. Different breads to star dish, herring, salmon, eggs, Sausages and my meatballs are piled on everyone's plates. And all that lovely food is washed down with a song and aquavit, which is Swedish snaps. My journey takes me inland to Sweden's Dalarna district. First, I'm heading for the old copper mining town of Fallon, after which I'm visiting the beautiful Lake Silian. Mining started in Fallon in the 12th century and at its peak it produced two-thirds of the world's copper ore. Today it's a World Heritage Site, but the mine's red copper pigment is still used to paint Sweden's wooden houses. And Fallon has another claim to fame. In those days, oxen were killed for their hides to make ropes to lift the really heavy bucket of copper ore. It took two oxen to make just one metre of rope, and over 15,000 were killed each year, which left a massive meat mountain. What do they do with all that flesh? Well, they made the Falu Kurov, also known as the Fallon Sausage. Now this mine actually shut down in 1992, but the love of the sausage lives on, and I'm going to find out what all the fuss is about. Ingemar? Yeah? Chef Ingemar? Yeah. Hi. Hi! I'm Marilise, nice to meet you, how are Hi. you? Yeah, it's good. I believe you're the man to come and see if I want to eat Fallon sausage? Yeah, I made seven only different dishes today. Seven? Seven dishes. I'm honoured as Ingemar Eberstol has cooked a special dish for Sweden's Princess Victoria, which he's going to prepare for me. But first... I'm going to try the sausage on its own, because I've never tried it before, so here goes. Wow, really meaty, very lightly smoked, but actually really quite delicious. Fun sausage carpaccio. Interesting. Fun sausage with mustard dressing and toast. There's definitely Fallon sausage in there. Fallon sausage with creamed macaroni and tomato sauce. Mm. Very tasty. Fallon sausage tastes exactly the same as it has done the last three times. And at this stage, I'm still quite liking it. Stir-fried Fallon sausage with creme fraiche and horseradish. And it tastes very similar to the taste it did the last few times. stir is great and it looks fantastic though. Fallon sausage in mustard sauce with mashed potato. Mustard sauce is wicked. I'm still enjoying it. And finally, the royal dish. Fallon Sausage Princess Victoria with poached vegetables. Fantastic. Mmm. Mmm. That is the best dish so far. And you know what? It's certainly fit for a princess. Thank you very much. From a princess to a king. The king of the forest, the moose, or elk as it's known in Scandinavia. It's the largest member of the deer family, and around 100,000 are shot each year for their rich meat, but the hunting is strictly regulated and special licenses are needed. I'm still in Sweden's Dalarna district, and I've travelled an hour north of Fallon to Lake Silian, which lies in the crater of one of the world's largest meteorite impacts, and the area's slopes are popular for winter skiing. I'm off to meet a local celebrity who's famed for something rather unusual. I'm meeting him at the top of this hill, but you know what? I couldn't be bothered to walk up. I thought I'd go up in this thing. It's wicked. I'm going to be meeting Lars Beckman, who became famous by accident when he appeared on a TV cooking show in Hollywood. And this is where this man's really famous for. Hi. Oh, hi there. You truly are hi the there. Swedish chef that inspired 
Swedish Chef of the Muppets. Hi. Hey. How are you doing, dear? Hey, how are you doing? My name is Lars. Can I introduce him to a character of mine? Yeah, you can. This is Miss Piggy, okay. yeah? My Miss Piggy. Yeah. Hi! Oh, that hurt. Well, get rid of that guy. Now we're going to start cooking here. <laughs> and we're going to cook moose, aren't we? All right, all right. Moose. That's the moose meat. We're going to Great. pound it out and make some rollades. Okay, bang. Bash, bash. Absolutely. This you want tenderizes, to try? doesn't you want it? You want to try to Oh, my finger. Jesus, she's a wild lady. All right, little bit good. You have to look good. No, 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 wait a minute. I got to take over. You can nice to see it. Oh, it's noisy, but it's perfect. Now, you see, we got the bacon. Okay. Got the bacon. Put a little bit of bacon inside. It's roll. Like this? It, it, yes. And this is nice smoked bacon with a bit of fat because I can see that the moose is very lean meat. Very lean, very lean. They hardly have any fat. You know, they have no fat. They're running in the woods all day long. You know, with the hunters in the back. You be nice and slim like me too. You know what I mean. <laughs> now we have some cornichons. So what do you call them in in and gherkin. gherkin? Baby gherkin. Well, cornichons are baby, baby gherkins. Baby gherkin. Two on each Two. one. Okay. That'd be fine. Two on each one. And we go in the middle. Do they yeah, want yeah, yeah, in the middle. Now we're going to roll them. Roll them. Okay. Okay. We go like this. Okay. All right. Toothpick. Just to secure. Okay, perfect. Put them there. You take a little bit of oil. One, uno, dos, tres. And they say that uh, moose meat is very good for you. I'm sure. And all the game is very good for you if you cook it right. Now I'm going to put that little roll, a roller. Do we season them first? Yeah. Will I season them first on here? Yeah. Well, I, 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 I actually do it in the pan. Let me okay. keep the seasoning in the pan. You see oh, here? Lovely. Yeah, you see yeah. what I do? Yeah. You got a little seasoning in nice. the bottom. Then you just roll them around. So you could do this with, I mean, you could do this with beef, couldn't you? you could yeah, do you can do chicken. it with beef, chicken, whatever. Roll them around, roll them around, the roll is. Oh, They're smelling great. Yeah. Oh, look at that, lovely and brown now. They, they're getting there. See? They hold up pretty good. Look at all the lovely juice in there. Yes, yes. Now we got some stock. And what kind of stock is this? A good, rich this meat is a stock? Meat stock. Kind of the gameish uh, uh, flavor, you know? Wild. We put them back in to keep all the flavor in the pan. Simple. When you have all the flavor in the pan, why don't you just you... tighten it up with a little bit of flour, a little bit of cream, and let it just simmer for a uh, a while. So that's our flour here? Yeah, there's flour here. This is cream. A little heavy cream. Look at that. Whippy, whippy. whippy. Okay, I'll whippy, whippy well, for yeah, you. Yeah, no yeah. problem. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> nice and smooth. How's yeah. that? Wow. Yeah, 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 yeah. More? Yeah. Great. Wonderful, wonderful. we got to mo move them a little bit. My... So using a roulade as a spoon. I, yeah, I, I use the roulade. See, I use the roulade like a spoon, like a stirrer. It's nice. Oh, it's you fantastic. Stir it around a little bit. It cook about 10, 15 minutes, so maybe a little <gasps> more than that. Perfect. So what are we serving the them sauce. with? There's some fantastic looking colours on the table yes. here. Yes, yes. Cloudberries. 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 Now I've got to try one. Because these are That's a bit of a treat here, aren't they? You bet. They are very, very, very rare. Wow. The they gold taste like of a Lapland. They taste like a cross between a raspberry and an orange. Yeah. We stir it up. With just a little bit of sugar, that's all you need. Look at that, perfect. Just a little bit. Stir it up. They have it to pancakes, they serve it with meatballs, they serve it with everything. Do I get to try the oh, mousse yeah. now? Yes, of course. And we're going to put some one, two, one. Okay, how about three? Three. Three, oh. and a little good sauce with that. Oh, look at that. Oh, <laughs> spoon yeah. from the side? Yes, yes. That colour, look, it's like a bit of sunshine. Isn't it's just that amazing. Fantastic? And a little final touch. Some scallions. Also, we have fresh lingam berries. Do you talk about colours? Isn't no, that beautiful? It's just beautiful. Huh? It's like a piece of art. It is. It is. Can I dive in? Yes. Now you get to oh, try it. The knife just went through. Oh, it like look butter. at that. Cloud berries. Yeah. And a little bit of potatoes. Mmm. The mousse. It moves. It's like a cross between venison and beef. Yes, it is. It's just, oh, it's just Bacon. fantastic. Yeah. But the Swedish yes. chef could have done no better than that. Fantastic. I don't think so. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. <You're> mm. I'm now heading north to the home of the Cloudberry and the remote countryside of Lapland, where a smaller member of the deer family roams free, the reindeer. During the 16th century, 
Whole herds of them were domesticated by Scandinavia's indigenous people, the Sami, who became herding nomads using the reindeer for food, trading, clothing and tool making. It's close to the Arctic Circle here and in winter the reindeer grow a thick insulating coat but this is shed during the summer months which gives them a patchy appearance. The Sami are the only people allowed by law to herd reindeer in Sweden and today around 3,000 Sami are still making a living from reindeer farming. Now, it's 12 o'clock, but it's not midday, it's midnight, because I'm in the land of the midnight sun. I'm here because today they're herding hundreds of reindeer for marking. And Lotta, is that Lotta? Hello, you must follow me now directly because the reindeer... They oh, are they're here inside. already? Yes. Oh my God, I can see them. Oh my God, I nearly missed it, did I? <laughs> you see a lot of them. That's Tom, Lotta's husband, and he's got that big stick because he does the catching. Oi! Okay, this one's number 36. And can I just show you he's got two little baby horns on his head, look. Oh. He's gonna catch the little white one. Oh, go find your mummy now, off you go. <laughs> there you see a little one. After a few hours sleep, I met Lotta at 12 o'clock midday for a cookery lesson. This is some of your amazing reindeer. Yes. It just looks... And this is a tongue? This is the tongue from the reindeer, yes. It's so soft. And then the meat, I mean, look at how dark. It's like deep, deep red. It just looks amazing. So how are we going to cook it? We uh, take off this and inside here I already put down the marrow bone to start to boil a little. I have also added salt, rich salt. And that's it? That's it. <gasps> okay, well, I'm going to pop the tongue in. It's so simple, very simple recipe. Yeah, so nice. And that's it, so it's just salt and water and then straight onto the heat. And how long is that going to cook for? Uh, around one and a half hour. Because it's long and slow. Yes. Oh, it's quite smoky. So we're going to leave that now. Fantastic. Which gives a city girl like me the chance to enjoy the peace and quiet of this beautiful environment, which is about an hour's drive away from the nearest town. Lotta and her family are keen to maintain their heritage and welcome visitors from all over the world to learn about their culture. So now we're back to our stew. It's ready. And what do we do? It's this. It's basically blood from the reindeer and it's mixed. Well, what's it mixed into it? Anything? Because so, it looks... I mean, look at that. It's so thick. Yeah. It's milk and it's uh, flour and it's salt. And then reindeer blood. I take part, so, and... I drop them like this. I let it be. And, the, and the heat will let it slide off the spoon. Yeah. So. Amazing. Can I try? Yes. Okay. You make it look really easy. I'm probably going to muck this up, but. You're laughing. I can hear you chuckling. Yeah. I'm laughing in your back. <laughs> Thanks. Now, how long do these take to cook? Uh, about 10, 15 minutes, not so long time. And you, and what, what happens? They just kind of... Yes, they start to flow up. The tongue is tender and even the blood dumplings look tasty. Woodland fruits full of vitamins have always been used to supplement the protein-rich Scandinavian diet and Lotta's made a lingonberry jam. Tom, we've made you a fantastic stew. You're going to come and eat? Looks great, doesn't it? Yes. Very good. Now, where's my plate? I'm starving. Yes. <gasps> I'm going to try dumpling first. Wow! You like it? The flavour is so intense. I mean, it's like, it's truly wild food, this, isn't it? Mm. I have to say, this experience has been wonderful. I, you know, the way that you live with the reindeer, you use every bit of the reindeer, you're sort of totally at one with nature. You can tell when you taste the food that you have a fantastic relationship with the reindeer. I just think it's brilliant.
Hey, how you doing? Coming to join us? <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> You're welcome. My Scandinavian journey now takes me to Sweden's capital, Stockholm. The city is often referred to as the Venice of the North as it's built on 14 islands and it's here you can savour all the country's traditional fare under one roof. I'm in Ostermann's Saluhall, which is the most famous food hall in Sweden. Not only a great place to learn about Scandinavian cuisine, but I get to do some food grazing too and look at this place, it's fantastic. tried uh, reindeer pate. Reindeer pate? Yeah. It's wow. very nice and it's very typical Swedish and you eat it with a cumberland sauce and some small gherkins. Oh lovely. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. That's great. Thank you so much. Yeah, bye, bye. bye. Hi. Hi. How are you doing? Very good. Um, Thank you. I've been told that I should buy some cracker bread to go with my reindeer yeah. pate. And I have this one. You can also try it if you oh, want. Oh I'd love to try it. Yeah. It's a uh, uh, whole wheat. Uh, sunflower and uh, rye also. That is fan. I bet that's really good for you as well. Yeah, it's very nice. It tastes fantastic. I'll take one of them. Thank you. Perfect for my picnic. Well, it's raining outside, so this coffee shop have said that I can have a little indoor picnic. I'm dying to try my cracker bread and my pate. Break off the bit of cracker bread like that. Some of this reindeer pate. A little bit of the sauce on the top. And a bite of gherkin. Mmm. Mmm. That combination is perfect. The cracker bread, wonderful texture, wonderful flavour. I can see why they're so bonkers about the stuff here. And the sweetness of the jam with the saltiness of the reindeer pate, it's fantastic. And. Oh, coffee's pretty good too. Cracker bread, or crisp bread's low water content, made it long-lasting and was the Vikings' own ship's biscuit. Its main ingredient, rye, was a crop which survived the poor soil and is still used in baking today, with loaves coming in all shapes and sizes. To find out more about the Scandinavians' love of bread, I'm travelling south and crossing the Ersund Bridge to Sweden's neighbour, Denmark, also famous for its Vikings. Its capital, Copenhagen, is Scandinavia's largest city. The city is a blend of cute canals and interesting architecture with a friendly vibe. In the past, fresh bread was a real luxury and rye bread was baked not just for taste but for its shelf life and that made it just a little on the heavy side. But believe it or not, even this brick of a loaf can be transformed into a work of art. Welcome to the Danish Open Sandwich, Denmark's favourite lunch dish. And you can taste one of these masterpieces at the famous St. Annie restaurant in Copenhagen. In the late 19th century, it also served as a brothel, but today it has a more wholesome reputation, and its owner, Soren Sko, often plays host to the Danish rich and famous. Hi, how are you? Welcome. I'm very excited about my lunch. I've heard mm. all sorts of fantastic things about your restaurant. <laughs> you can look forward. I am. Yeah. Very, I'm hungry and very excited. First of all, I'm going to be tasting a sandwich, a fried fillet of place, with asparagus, shrimp and caviar. Well, Soren will be sampling one of smoked herring with radishes, onions, chives and egg yolk. Wow, look at that. What's this one? This is, uh, we call it shooting star. Shooting star, uh, oh, lovely. Yeah, yeah. Oh, and, and that's got is, a that, herring. That is smoked herring. And a raw egg with to go on top of it. Egg yolk, you, you put mix it on it. the top, oh, yes. Fantastic. Open sandwiches have become a popular lunch dish all over Denmark. They originated in the fields when farmers had the leftovers from the previous night's dinner on top of a slice of rye bread and were used for lunch packs for workers during the Industrial Revolution. Next sandwich for me is steak tartare. Lean raw beef served with onions, capers, pickles, fresh horseradish and another glistening egg yolk. For Soren, it's liver pate and salted beef topped with a meat jelly. 
That is amazing. The texture yeah. just melts in the mouth. Mm. Now, what have you got? It looks very interesting. The Vitz Nightco. And you made that's all. It's all made here in the kitchen. Yes. combination of flavors is just fantastic it's salty a little bit smoked yeah. and then the jelly and the jelly and the, the, the textures yeah. that is way more than a sandwich yeah <laughs> although the Danes love their savory dishes they're also very fond of a sweet treat and there's no better place than Copenhagen to learn how to make that sinfully rich indulgence the Danish pastry I'm about to get a cookery lesson from chef Lars Yule at La Glace the country's oldest patisserie Hi, wow, lovely cakes. I'm looking for Lars. Yes, he's upstairs. It's uh, just go straight out. Great, thank you. Hello, Lars. Oh, hello, Hi, Marilise. I'm Marilise. Nice to hello. meet you. How are you? I'm very good, thank you. I'm very excited about learning how to make Danish pastries. Okay. I can help. Yeah. Okay, that's a fun... I need a half on lid. So. Okay. Yeah. Just tell me about the other ingredients yeah. we've got here. Well, we need some water. One litre. I'll put it up here. It it's cold very cold. Why is that? All the ingredients have to be very cold because we don't want the uh, yeast to to work. How much water is that? One liter. Exactly half a liter of eggs. Yeah. Mm, beautiful. <laughs> and then the yeast. Just a little... Yeast is a fungus which feeds on sugar, producing carbon dioxide bubbles, causing the pastry to rise. Now you can put the flour. And that's butter in there, okay? <laughs> <laughs> and you can take 25 gram of salt and sugar. Sugar. Beautiful. And then we have to mix it again. I can see it's just coming together. Wow, look at that. <laughs> and do you like feel your way now with the Danish pastry? I can imagine that, you know, after years, it just becomes sort of second nature to you. It's a passion, and you know, you have to, to feel it in the fingers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And in your heart. Blimey, how do you do that? Like this. <laughs> ah, ah, yeah. Nothing low fat will do, and rich unsalted butter is essential for this recipe. We're sandwiching an amazing two and a half kilograms between the pastry. So, okay. it's ready to, uh, to get rolled. Over here. Okay, are you ready? So. Now we have to get it together. Okay, oh gosh, Put it really? together. In between rolling, the pastry and butter are folded three times. Three times more and three times again, resulting in numerous delicate layers. Wow! One, two, three, four, five, six. How cool is that? Yeah. <laughs> See the 26 layers? I can actually visually. Great. No, 27. Layers. Oh, sorry, I missed one. So now we have to get it in the freezer okay, to fine. rest a little bit. Perfect. 20 minutes later, guess what happens to it? Yes, it's rolled again, ready for cutting. It's huge now. I tell you, it's very beautiful, this one. Oh. Can you see it? Bit of this marzipan in every single one. So marzipan, good. made from ground almonds and sugar, is a traditional ingredient in Danish pastries. Goes like this. And they're made this. in different shapes for different fillings. So, and over there. So, so. We will walk away for half an hour, and you will see when you come back. Then we'll puffed up. Although it's called a Danish pastry, it was in fact introduced to Denmark in the 19th century by Viennese bakers who were drafted in when local bakers were on strike. I'm glazing the pastries with egg yolk and filling some of them with creme patissiere, which is a vanilla custard. Ta -da! Beautiful. And topping them with seasonal fruits and nuts. So. Now they are ready for baking. And how long are they going to cook for? 13 minutes. Exactly 13. Exactly 13 minutes. See, pastry chef that knows what he's doing. <laughs> so we can't even so, yet, can we? Can, we can, I, can I dive in? No, no, not yet. Because we have to decorate them. So first we give them a little bit, but only a little bit, 
of this syrup. Because it makes them look so shiny. Yeah. So, now can we eat them? No. Not no? Yet. No. First we have to put some cream in the bowls here. This is the creme patissiere again, is it? The yeah. vanilla cream? It is. Would we like to eat them now? Now we need some icing sugar here. And chocolate. And chocolate. <laughs> Look, he looks so excited, doesn't he? <laughs> so, okay. Careful on Oops. the top. I was going to say, well, I lick that. I think maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I think maybe. So, okay. your turn. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Good laugh at me now. No. Look at the mess that yeah. made you laugh. <laughs> we finished. Now we can taste it. Hey! Nice to have you here. Thank you. The final leg of my journey takes me from one city of canals back to another on Sweden's southwest coast, Gothenburg. Scandinavia's food culture has come a long way since the Vikings, with international influences and fresh food more readily available. Gothenburg is a major port and commercial city and has a thriving fish market, where I'm going to meet celebrity chef Leif Manestrum. Leif, Leif, Leif. Hey, good morning. <laughs> nice to see you. <laughs> Welcome to the market in Gothenburg. Var det för en 140? Fem, vad vet jag. Ja, 971, 2, 3, 8. Okay. Go on, how much? Uh, 188. Okay, so $25 a kilo. Mucho, mucho. Leif has invited me to join him at his restaurant, Her Magazinet, which is one of four Michelin-starred restaurants in the city. Leif was one of the originators of new Scandinavian cuisine, and if you thought it was all about meatballs and herrings, you were wrong. And Leif's going to work his magic on a creature that a few years ago was considered too ugly to eat. A monkfish is not a pretty fish, it has to be said. And what I find incredible about it is the fact that it's nearly all head. Yes, it's, it's uh, up to, uh, I think it's 60, 60, 65% it's a uh, head. But when you get to the flesh, what's so lovely about it is there's no bones. It's the most no. wonderful, wonderful fish. Absolutely. So what are you going to do with your delicious monkfish? I'm going to make, to first I will be going to start to do a stock of uh, these very tasteful uh, shrimps. I start with the, with, the, um, with the onions, a little bit of onions like this. Okay. I'm going to make a stock out of the shell, right. together with a little bit of tomato. We're going to roast this tomato paste a little bit, together with, together with, the, with the onions. Onions, lovely. Now... In the shrimp heads go? Yes. How's that looking? Roasted and... Yes. Smells now we, great. Now we put in some water. Okay. Just a little, because... That's enough, like this, because we are just going to take out the flavour of that. Fantastic. So, monkfish. That uh, size? Is it <gasps> yes, enough for you? No. <laughs> okay. Look how firm. I mean, I just think the, that's just solid meat. It's just the most fantastic fish, isn't it? It's very nice fish. Can you add some butter in the pan, Maybe frying blue. pan? Yes. Healthy, you know. <laughs> Not too much. Everything else it's is good, healthy. It's good, but healthy. I take some salt, sea salt. Do you want a bit of oil in there as well to stop it burning? A little bit, yes, a little bit, yes. Some pepper. Now, when the butter is silent, it's ready for the fish. Oh, lovely. Like that. Takes around uh, eight to ten minutes, I think. I think, uh, I think it's nearly on. ready now. So I can take up some, a plate here, put them here, and, oh. keep, and keep them warm. For the chanterelles. Oh, the chanterelles. I love mushrooms. So that's just butter they're going into. Yes. Butter. So we fry them a bit. A little bit salt. Oh, look at them. I love the way they go shiny when they're... A little bit, little that bit of pepper. So. A wonderful starts going in. Oh, oh, the smell. If you could only have smell of vision. Um, are you ready for cream? Oh, and so, so we add the cream. It's going to go back into, into our sauce. sauce. Oh. <laughs> it's nearly like a pepper steak. Now oh. we're going to add 
chives into it. Just before serving, we got to to use the shrimps. Okay. Are we going to eat lunch? I hope so. Okay. Shall I go and change? And Put... drink some wine? Yes, please. I'll see you in a minute. Bye. Hey, he doesn't look so ugly anymore, does he? No. <laughs> wow, it looks fantastic. Nice colors, huh? <gasps> and and so the prawns. We, and... As you can see, we all add the, 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 the shrimps. And the dill. Yes, of course. Mmm. The monkfish is such a, it's so meaty, and the saltiness and the sweetness of the shrimps. Mmm, still juicy inside. Simply cooked, fantastic ingredients, no showing off. It's just delicious. Well, it's goodbye to Scandinavia, and I really have had a fantastic time here. I guess I came thinking that the food was going to be really basic, but it's far from that. The people here are incredibly proud of their food heritage. They embrace their local produce, its seasonality, and everything just looks so beautiful on the plate. It's been a real surprise to me, and I've loved it. I'll definitely be back. Mm -hmm.